hello everyone. Uh, for those of you who can see me or can't see me, I'll try and speak as clearly and as slowly as possible so that nothing uh, is missed or anything like that. Um, but if there's anything that I'm going too quickly over or you want to know more about, please feel free to ask um, and we'll go over all of your questions at the end. Um, so thank you so much, Zoe, for introducing me. Um, so actually, my first line was going to be who I am, but you already know that. So excellent. Let's skip past that. Um, so tonight's talk is called um, From Theatre in Victorian Toronto to Victorian Theatre in Toronto, otherwise known as Once More with Lamplights. Um, and so through this talk, we're going to uh, highlight how theatre's roots in we're going to highlight theater's roots in Toronto and how early performers shape the theaters of Toronto today, uh, as well as how Victorian theatrical techniques were utilized in Canada and how we're adapting them for our performances today. Um, so that's kind of a, a broad overview. Um, I'm probably going to ramble about a lot of things. I'm going to try to stay under the 40-ish um, minutes. I've just started my timer, so I don't talk too much. Um, so my background is actually more in drama. Uh, my formal education is in theater, and so that's where my interest came from that. Um, but I also have done a lot of uh, historically based uh, work recently. And so I was able to fortunately uh, merge both of my passions, and I'm uh, what's called a museum theater practitioner. So for those of you who haven't heard of uh, museum theater before, and I hadn't before I started doing it. Um, so museum theater is the use of drama or theatrical techniques within a museum setting or as a part of the museum's offerings with the goal of provoking an emotive and cognitive response in visitors concerning a museum's discipline or exhibitions. So that's a fairly wordy explanation, um, but basically what it means is that I use theater and performance to uh, tell what the museum is trying to get across in um, what they're giving out to their visitors. And uh, so most of my um, experience with performing in museums and things like that have been in the Victorian era. And uh, specifically, this um, presentation came about because of a monologue that I was researching uh, through my work with Black Creek Pioneer Village about a young woman named Ellen Williams Hardy uh, and how women were involved in Victorian theater. Um, but I'll talk more about her later. And so now let's let's forge on ahead with our presentation. So, oh, I forgot to go to my first slide, but we'll just see if that actually works. Give me one moment. Do it. Oh, we're all on tender hooks. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Well, there's me as Chewbacca, so that everyone can have a good laugh. Um, I thought of going with a professional picture, but I decided against it. Now I can't even see my mouse. That's okay. I hope. Oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. All right. So hopefully everyone can now see my pictures of the Victorian theaters. So I thought I'd start off. Um, by talking about some tropes of Victorian theatre. Now I'm specifically talking about Victorian theatre in England um, because that's where it all started. Um, so Victorian theatre development was impacted heavily by the Licensing Act of 1737. Now this sounds like a fairly um, fairly intimidating thing, um, but it was actually just what restricted play productions to two theatres in London. Now, these two theatres were the Drury Lane Theatre and the Covent Garden Theatres. So these were then known as the Patent Theatres. So this meant that only these two theatres were allowed to perform plays, be it Shakespeare or otherwise. There were supposed to be no other theatres allowed in uh, Victorian England at that time, but because humans are very, very smart and have ways of skirting around things, <laughs> um, Victorians decided that they were going to invent a Whole new form of theatre in order to get around these restrictions. And so uh, these illegal, otherwise known as non-patent theatres, they started popping up in different places around England. And so they would intersperse dramatic scenes with musical interludes. And so that was how they, it was kind of, kind of like a, a musical, but uh, slightly less put together. <laughs> um, so these forms of drama were what were called uh, melodramas. So I know that uh, a lot of us know that word today. 
because um, of if you're being overly dramatic about something, people will say, oh, you're being so melodramatic. But the word actually comes from mellow, which is Greek, meaning music, and drama, meaning, well, drama. <laughs> um, so melodrama was performed at a lot of these uh, non-patent theaters. Uh, it was characterized by over-the-top acting and musical interludes. And uh, there was also burlesque performances that happened in these non-patent theaters. So these two forms of theater, they eventually became so popular in the non-patent theaters that they started popping up in the patent theaters. And so burlesque and melodrama went from being an illegal thing to being a very socially acceptable thing. Um, now, these two forms of drama as the illegal forms of drama were dropped in 1843 when a new licensing act came out. So that's why towards the end of the 19th century, uh, we saw more wider, a wider variety of uh, dramas being presented. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a better a definition of what a melodrama is. Uh, they are short scenes interspersed with musical accompaniment that are characterized by moral stories and they use stock characters. So these are the hero, the heroine, the villain, and the clown. Now, some of you may be familiar with this because of another form of theater called Commedia dell'arte. And that's an Italian form of theater that I'll talk about again later. Um, but I just wanted to touch on that in case anyone was sitting there going, hey, doesn't that do that? It is. Um, Yes, so I mentioned it was known for its over-the-top style. Um, another part of the Victorian theater world that was very prominent were what were called actor managers. So these were people who were in charge of theaters who also played the lead roles. Now, I like to think of these people as Victorian Lin-Manuel Mirandas. For those of you who don't know who that is, he's the gentleman who wrote and is in the starring role of Hamilton in the musical Hamilton. Um, so these are people who would um, buy theaters for themselves and then they would act in the lead roles in all of the productions. Um, so towards the end of the 19th century, uh, there were also what were called pictorial dramas. So these were performances that placed a great deal of emphasis on costume accuracy and history. They had impressive costumes and stage designs that necessitated lengthy scene changes. So as, oh, I've been forgetting about my slides. I'm so sorry. I'm going to go ahead. So there's an example of our, um, our melodrama. And those two actors there are actually um, giving us an example of two Victorian gestures, which were things that, movements that actors could do on stage that would let the audience know how they were feeling without saying anything. Now, as I mentioned before, that was largely because actors in non-patent theaters weren't supposed to be saying much on stage. So instead of saying, oh, I'm so frightened, the actors on stage would go like this. And uh, oh, if you can't see me, it doesn't really make sense. Anyways, it's what the gentleman is doing in the picture. <laughs> and he's putting his head into his elbow and looking very, very forlorn. Uh, the woman down on the floor, she's exhibiting uh, the pleading or begging gesture. So because of the use of these gestures, they were very, very easy uh, to communicate to the audience what the actors were feeling. Keep forgetting. Okay, there we go. There's an example of our pictorial dramas. Um, so I know that all of you have your mics muted, so you can't yell out the answer. Um, but I won't tell you what play it is. I'll just give you a second to, in your mind or out loud because I can't hear you, uh, guess which play this is. It's a, it's a Shakespearean play. I'll give you a sec. And the answer is Richard III. <laughs> so as you can see here, the costumes are beautiful. Uh, the set from what we can see of it looks quite lovely. And so these were two of the hallmarks of pictorial dramas. Um, anything else about them? No? Okay, so another popular form of drama in the Victorian era uh, were what were called sensation dramas. And these were um, 
Advancements in special effects made technology and machinery and performances the main attractions. So people started coming to the theater, not just for what the show was about, but also to be able to see these incredible things. So the picture that I have up on the screen here is from a show called The Whip. I believe it was performed in 1861, if my memory serves me. And as you can see in the picture, we have a pretty epic looking um, train crash. And you can see kind of how they've gone ahead and done it. They have the uh, train prop and then at the front of the train, they've created a flat that makes it look like the train has crashed. You've got the bodies lying everywhere. And so a lot of Victorian theater, uh, in addition to being very melodramatic and very over the top, was very titillating. It was very exciting. And so a lot of people came to the theater because they wanted to be excited. And that'll come up a lot in this presentation. Um, so yes, that's sensation dramas. Find my mouse again, there we go. And another popular form of drama in the Victorian times were cup and saucer dramas. Now the definition of that is that they were problem plays that dealt with serious and sensitive issues of the day. They were more natural and less over the top than melodramas. So cup and saucer shows, they were more popular towards the end of the 19th century, as I mentioned before, because after the change of uh, the licensing, licensing act, I was gonna say agreement, wanted to make sure I had my um, phrasing right. After the licensing act was changed in 1843, uh, people were now able to, um, they were able to perform plays. They were able to uh, speak in plain voice and um, yeah, not be as big and dramatic and over the top or perform in burlesques. <laughs> um, so I'll talk about this uh, more at the end, um, but as you can tell from looking and hearing about a lot of these dramas and plays, um, a lot of them are still very prominent in our performances today. Like I know I went and saw The Sound of Music when I was a young one because I really wanted to see how they did the, um, what's the scene at the start where she's sitting on the hill and when I saw it, it was like this, this big moving thing and she was walking on it and it was rolling and it was fantastic. And that's also why Victorians went to the theater because they wanted to be amazed by the stage machinery and technology that they were seeing. But I also know that I really like going to see shows that uh, deal with issues that are relevant to me now. And so that's more of the cup and saucer dramas. Um, so going to see a show that uh, takes place within the present or in the, the recent past. Uh, they deal with issues that are relevant to the audience now. Um, and I missed one, didn't I? Yes, with pictorial dramas too, it's the same thing. Uh, I know I love going to the theater and uh, seeing all of the incredible costumes with the, even the most minute details are historically accurate. And you can tell that someone has worked painstakingly on that dress to make sure that it's uh, appropriate to the era and appropriate for the actor. So a lot of these Victorian drama uh, tropes they were started in England, and not only did they come across to Canada, because Canada was a British colony, uh, but they've also permeated through time to uh, influence how we perform today. Um, so those are just a few of the Victorian theatre tropes that I wanted to touch on. Um, let's see if I can find my arrow again. There we are. And so now I wanted to jump into the Toronto specific Victorian theater scene. So for a long time, Toronto didn't have a theater scene. <laughs> it was uh, a rather isolated, um, hard to get to city. And that was largely because of the lack of um, rail routes, railroads, railroad routes <laughs> that would come to Toronto from other places. And because a lot of early Victorian theater was based around traveling theater troops, if these theater troops couldn't make it into Toronto, well, then people just weren't going to get the shows. So one of the, no, it was the first theater in Toronto uh, was the Theater Royale. 
I call it the Theater Royale. It's probably the Theater Royal, but Royale sounds fancier, so we're going to go with that. Um, it was the first theater opened in Toronto, and it was opened in 1839. Now, you'll notice when I talk about the next theater, I also refer to it as uh, a sort of first theater in Toronto, but you'll see specifically why in a minute. Um, so the Theatre Royale, uh, it was actually a converted carpentry shop, and it was on the northeast corner of York and King Streets. There is now a massive National Bank financial building there. Uh, there, is, there are no remnants of this very beautiful theatre. Well, actually, in all honesty, it probably wasn't that beautiful because it didn't have that many, uh, the, many of the amenities that we're accustomed to when we go to see shows today, or even in the Victorian times. Uh, it was also behind the Shakespeare Hotel. So this was a very important aspect of the Theatre Royale because um, it would encourage a lot more traveling theatre troops to come to Toronto if they had a place to stay. So with the Shakespeare Hotel being right behind it, uh, troops could come in, perform, have a place to sleep right there. Easy peasy. So prior to the construction of the Theatre Royale, uh, performances were held in taverns or on temporary premises or in hotel dining rooms. So there weren't really any set places for these performances, and that's part of the reason why troops didn't want to come to Toronto, because if they didn't have a proper place to perform, then why would they come? Um, now, unfortunately for the Theatre Royale, it uh, burned down in a fire in 1843. And unlike some of my other slides, I don't have as much information on, on the Theatre Royale. That's probably because it's a rather old theater. Uh, if anyone else has found anything more on the theater and knows more about it, please share it with me because I started getting myself very confused with the Theater Royale. And then the next theater I'm going to talk about is the Royal Lyceum. And so to keep the two apart was very confusing. But anyways, so that's what I found about uh, the Theater Royale. So now we're going to talk about the Royal Lyceum. That's how I believe it's pronounced. If I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize. Um, so the Royal Lyceum was the first purpose-built theater in Toronto. So unlike the Theater Royale, uh, it was built for the explicit purpose of being a theater. It wasn't a carpentry shop before that or anything like that. Um, and it's debated about when it was opened. It could have been September 25th, 1849, could have been December 28th, 1848. Uh, but what we do know is that it was also the first proper theatre in Ontario, right here in Toronto. Pretty sweet. Uh, it was built by a gentleman named John Ritchie, and it was on the south side of Adelaide Street West between Bay and York. And I have a picture of... I'm going to skip ahead. Okay, so this, this is what the interior of the Royal Lyceum looked like. Um, and... It, while it was better established than the Theatre Royale, it was still drawing um, fairly minor acts. There were no big touring theatre companies that were coming into the Theatre Royale. They had a lot of Toronto-based artists and um, things like that. Uh, they were also home to Toronto's first operatic club, if I remember correctly. Anyways. Um, so they featured operas, plays, groups of actors, strolling musicians, soloists, and elocutionists, which I thought was pretty excellent. I could probably use the assistance of an elocutionist. Um, they were the, uh, they had proper stage lights, and they also had an orchestra pit, which you can actually see in the picture. Uh, it's the little um, kind of half oval shape right in front of the, uh, the stage line. Now, one interesting thing about the orchestra pit at the Royal Lyceum was that the orchestra pit was not sunken. So if you were sitting on the orchestra level, you could have a French horn blowing in your ear for the whole performance. It would kind of detract from it. And so that's why usually the lower classes sat on the orchestra level. Upper classes sat in the um, balconies and things like that, which is completely different from how it is today. Like if you have money, you are sitting in the orchestra area, if you're like me and you can't afford very much theater, um, you are up in the nosebleeds on a stool. Um, so as I was mentioning, there weren't a lot of big touring theater companies that were coming to the Royal Lyceum. And so a man named John Nickinson swept in in uh, 1852 
and he began the Nickinson Theater Company with his daughter, Charlotte Nickinson. Now, she is very important, and I'd actually like to take a moment for those of you who can see behind me and introduce to you my own uh, Charlotte Nickinson Morrison. She later became when she was married. Uh, for those of you who can't see, I have a um, body form mannequin behind me dressed in a uh, Victorian dress and wearing a crown. So that's my, uh, that's my Charlotte Morrison here behind me. So the Nickinsons, they uh, were from the States and they were doing a tour of Buffalo and they came to Toronto, I think it was just kind of on a whim, and they saw that there was a theatrical gap in Toronto that needed to be filled. And uh, they were very important in paving the way for Toronto to be seen as a serious theater community. Now, Charlotte, Charlotte Nickinson, she is right now, uh, she was the leading lady there uh, at the Royal, Ly Royal Lyceum. I'll go back to the other picture so you can see there's the floor plan of the Royal Lyceum. So she was the leading lady there from 1851 to 1858, uh, and that's when she retired to marry a newspaper critic and editor. And when her husband died in 1871, she then moved on to manage the Grand Opera House, which I'll be talking about next. Now, the the usual routine for the Nickinsons was that they would have um, their core actors, who were John Nickinson, Charlotte Nickinson, uh, Elizabeth Phillips, and Elizabeth's husband, Owen. And so that was uh, usually the main cast of any performances that they did at the Royal Lyceum, but they would also bring in guest artists because that would make their shows exciting. So instead of having huge uh, groups of um, touring theater troops, they would have one or two theater artists come in and guest star. Uh, and they performed one of their most um, important performances was Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1853 and The Octo Rune in 1861. Now, both of these performances, uh, in case you haven't read them, I haven't, but I've done a bit of research on them. Uh, they both deal with themes of anti-slavery, which uh, harkens back to our cup and saucer dramas. So they dealt with um, issues of the day, issues of race and things like that. Um, I think it was the Octo Rune also includes an exploding riverboat scene. <laughs> that was very interesting. And so that harkens back to the, wait for it, the sensational, the sensation dramas where people would come to the theater to see incredible feats of technology. And so the Royal Lyceum had an expl exploding riverboat. Uh, both of these shows were also described as being very melodramatic, very over the top. And so that's how the Victorian theater bled into those shows at the Royal Lyceum. Now, as I mentioned, um, the Royal Lyceum suffered the isolation of Toronto. There was a great expense and difficulty of transportation that kept professional touring companies away. However, in 1870, there was a great improvement of rail lines and encouraged what were called theater circuits, where big touring productions, they could be presented in the same form in different places. So, for example, that's how I got to see my performance of The Sound of Music, the same way that it was done in New York City. Um, bigger and better rail lines also allowed for better sets and costumes, because as rail car sizes grew, um, so could the sets and the costumes. The Royal Lyceum seated about 750 people. I'm just going to skip ahead and see if I have any more. Oh, no, I don't have any more sets. Okay, that's fine. Um, it seated about 750 people, and as you can tell by this picture, uh, they were all seated. Um, but unfortunately, the Royal Lyceum suffered the same fate as the Theatre Royale, and it burned to the ground in 1874, but it was replaced by the Royal Opera House. Now, I really wish that the British would come up with some different names so that it's not Theatre Royale, Royal Lyceum, Grand Opera House, Royal Opera House. They're very hard to keep straight, so if anyone's getting confused, I'll help you. Um, so let's talk about... Where's my mouse set? Let's talk about the Grand Opera House, which is our jewel in our crown of Victorian theatre in Toronto. It is terribly creative naming. 
Um, so the Grand Opera House opened in uh, on September 21st, 1874, and it was on Adelaide west of Young. And I Google mapped that, and uh, that's where the Scotia Plaza in the Financial District is now. So if any of you want to go and look at it, um, that's where it would be. There's unfortunately no real remnants of any of these theaters. The Grand Opera House just has a laneway named after it. It's called the Grand Opera Lane, and it is in its original location where it was beside the Opera House. Uh, so unlike the um, the Royal Lyceum, so that's the last one we talked about, um, it had a seating capacity of 1,750. So that's 1,000 more than the Royal Lyceum. Uh, now, the problem with that was that at the Grand Opera House, let's see if I've got my floor plan here, there we go, um, it had um, standing room only on its orchestra level. And so that's a lot like if any of you have been to uh, Shakespeare's Globe, that's like the, the groundlings who are there standing for the whole performance, which I do not envy. Uh, so it opened with the, um, a play called School for Scandal by Sheridan. But the Grand Opera House, what cross streets for the Grand Opera House? It was at Adelaide West of Young, if that's any help. Anyways, okay, um, I'm going to continue. So the Grand Opera House was unfortunately, it was damaged by a fire, thankfully not destroyed like its two prede predecessors uh, in 1879. But in this fire, uh, there was a stage carpenter, his wife and infant daughter who were all killed, which was very, very sad to read. Um, but for some reason, it was rebuilt in a whopping 51 days. That is such fast reconstruction. I really wish that we could get the guys who built that to finish the uh, construction that we have going on on Eglinton here in Toronto. Um, and so it reopened in 1880 and the first show that performed uh, then was Romeo and Juliet, a classic. Now, much like the Royal Lyceum, uh, it was lit by gas lamps, but these gas lamps were ignited by batteries, which was very exciting. It was the first in the city to feature gas lights that could all be switched on or off simultaneously. So if you weren't coming to the theater to be excited by what you were seeing on stage, you were coming to the theater to be excited by light switches. Um, the stage, as you'll see in the picture here, it was pretty big. And uh, that was because it had to allow large scale productions. Our good old sensation dramas were not very good for small sized houses. Um, it was originally owned and operated by, for those of you who can see me, I'm going to sweep back to my lovely uh, Charlotte Nickinson Morrison back here. For those of you who can't, I hope you remember who she is. Uh, so she went from the Royal Lyceum to managing the Grand Opera House. And under Charlotte Morrison's direction, the uh, Opera House flourished. It did really, really well. There were many, many big companies that were coming in, that were touring. And um, it was just, it was doing very well. Sorry, if I sound like I'm trailing off, I keep getting distracted by the updates of what you're typing. But please don't stop typing. It's great. I just <laughs> wanted to explain to you why I'm uh, trailing off. Um, so there was Charlotte Morrison, nee Nickinson, um, and then after she left, uh, O.B. Shepard was the manager, and then, well, then came Ambrose J. Small. Now, I hope a few of you have heard that name before, and because Mr. Small was possibly, oh, yes, excellent, uh, he was the most infamous uh, oh, yes, mystery. Excellent. I'm glad you guys have heard about that because I hadn't and I was I was very excited when I read about it. Um, so Ambrose Small booked less reputable um, and more titillating shows at the theater and the Grand Opera House unfortunately started to do more poorly with him at the helm. So the Grand Opera House uh, did really well with a woman at the helm and did really poorly with a man at the helm. Hmm. That sounds familiar. <laughs> um, so the Grand Opera House uh, starting to go into problems. It wasn't helped by Small's gambling. 
He also had rumors of infidelity and less than legal operations by times. So Small was not a great dude all around. <coughs> Um, now, a really interesting fact for uh, actually everyone, because you can all see it. Uh, so the theater had an entrance off of Johnson Lane. So that's on the left side of the floor plan that you can see here. And it was the entrance to that, that entrance to the theater only Small had the keys to. Uh, it became rumored that this entrance led to a secret love nest where Small had liaisons with women who weren't his wife. Now that sounds very intriguing, and I was of course very interested by that, and so I looked further into that. But in reality, that entrance led to his private office that he shared with his secretary. Now if you're like me, you'll go, oh, but he shared it with a secretary. Well, maybe that means, no, no, no. Uh, his secretary uh, was a man, and he was named Jack Doughty. Now remember that name for later on. Uh, anyways, the exit meant that Small could leave the theater without having to go through the lobby and be seen by people that he could have owed debts to or um, people that he had <clears throat> cheated on and things like that. Uh, so that was fairly handy for him. So I think I'll just check and see if I have any more slides. No. All right. So now I'll get to see my silly face. Um, so those were the three main Victorian theaters in Toronto at the time. There were others, and there were others that were very important that popped up just after that. For example, the Elgin and Winter Garden Theater has a fascinating history that I could go into for a long time. Uh, but because I only have 15 minutes left, I'm going to uh, forge onwards. So now I'm going to talk about how we um, utilize Victorian theater practices here in Toronto today. Uh, so the picture that you're now seeing on the screen uh, is me in my uh, position at Black Creek Pioneer Village. So at Black Creek, uh, we use the history of the buildings to inform people about what life was like in 19th century Toronto. And this is through the eyes of people who lived and worked in the buildings. So my job specifically is to learn about these people's lives and then take their lives and make them into performances for all of our visitors. So one of the main ways that I perform for our visitors is through are through monologues. And so these monologues are akin to the cup and saucer plays of the 19th century. Uh, they're single actor performances where the we know Miriam. So, oh yeah, yeah. Katie Bryski was one of the uh, original. Well, yeah, she was one of the original um, history actors, which is what I am now. So excellent. Um, so it's a single actor performance where the actor speaks directly to the audience in plain language. So I would be talking to the audience just as I'm speaking to you now, uh, except maybe with a bit more Victorian era language. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it was in creating one of these, uh, specifically called Ellen's Encore, about a young woman named Ellen Williams Hardy. She changed her last name three times, so it's a little bit hard to keep track. Uh, and she lived in one of the buildings called Berwick House, um, and I was very interested in learning about the uh, history of theatre in Toronto, and she had a connection to it, so that's how um, I springboarded off of there. Um, I also used her to talk about how important women were in Victorian theatres in Toronto, um, but I'll talk about women when I talk about pantomimes, which is what I'm going into next. So pantomimes are another way that um, I, as a history actor, utilize Victorian dramatic techniques in um, modern day Toronto to talk about Victorian history. Uh, so. I assume that a lot of you know what a pantomime is. Maybe you've gone to see a Ross Petty pantomime that takes place down at the Elgin Theatre. Apparently they've been happening since 1996, which I thought was rather remarkable. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, pantomimes were a popular form of melodrama that was born out of the Commedia dell'arte, was born out of Commedia dell'arte, which was an Italian entertainment that used stock characters, music, and acrobatics. Uh, pantomimes were created through the combination of basic comedia characters and well-known tales such as Robin Hood, Cinderella, and Mother Goose. So pantomimes were kind of a combination of uh, Commedia dell'arte, melodrama, and common tales that everybody who came to the theatre would be familiar with. 
Um, they were very similar to melodramas in many ways with their stock characters, over the top acting, and morality tales. So in our performances of pantomimes at um, Black Creek, we utilize the characters of the hero, the heroine, uh, the villain, and the clown. And we have two pantomimes that we typically do. Uh, one is called O Canada, and it tells the story of Confederation. And that's what the pictures that you see on the screen are from. The middle one is me playing uh, the Maritime Provinces. The one on the left is me playing Uncle Sam, who is supposed to be the United States. And on the right is me playing Queen Victoria herself uh, in a, a very over-exaggerated manner. Um, and we also have another pantomime called The Laundry Thief that tells uh, the true story of how a pair of bloomers were stolen off of the line at our halfway house, which is our hotel, um, in a very comedic and funny way. Now, pantomimes came about a lot because of the backlash from the Licensing Act restrictions. So audiences came to the theater after this, and they no longer wanted to be restrained in what they could do at the theater. They wanted to be able to talk to the actors. And so that's what pantomimes allowed them to do. They, how intriguing, missing bloomers, you say, yes, yes, you should come see the show and then I'll be happy to tell you all about it. <laughs> um, so I was saying, sorry, one moment. Yes, right. So pantomimes were great because they not only allowed the audience to talk back to the actors, but they encouraged them to talk back to the actors. Uh, we give our audience um, things to do when certain characters enter. So, for example, what do we do when the queen enters? Oh, goodness, I can't remember. Oh, the quarantine is um, playing with my brain. But anyways, uh, Oh, when Uncle Sam enters, the whole audience boos because he's the villain, and so nobody likes him, and so they boo. Um, now, pantomimes were often performed uh, around Christmas. They usually opened on Boxing Day, and so that's why we have such a strong association today with pantomimes and Christmas. That's also probably why Ross Petty does them around Christmas time. Now, uh, pantomimes were also known for uh, female principal boys and panto dames. So pantomimes were excellent because they really encouraged gender swapping. Now, as many of you know, men had been playing women in, in the theater um, up until the 1660s. And that was because women weren't allowed on stage. But in pantomimes, men played women, but they played up their masculine characteristics. It was meant to be something funny instead of something serious. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, women also got in the act by playing male lead roles. This was because, as I mentioned earlier, everyone went to the theater because they wanted to be excited. They wanted to be titillated. I love saying that word, so that's why you're hearing it so often. Um, because, of course, this was in an age when uh, women wore floor-length skirts. You didn't see anything except their face and their hands. Um, and so going to the theater and seeing a woman performing in tights and shorts. Oh my goodness, men were fainting in the aisles. No, they weren't, but I thought that was funny. Um, all right, so the last thing, I'll just check if I have any more slides about this. Oh, no, get a sneak peek into what we're talking about next. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about with regards to uh, Victorian theater in uh, modern performances are our education programs. So I also do educational programs based around Victorian theater. These are either done through our um, field trip groups that we get coming to Black Creek or to the Gibson House Museum or with live history. Um, but also with Black Creek, I do go into libraries and perform in our um, important, but that's second house. So hi, Sharifa. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Yes, with our MAP program at the Toronto Public Library. So that's the Museum Access Pass program. Um, and so that's where I get to talk about the gestures. So with uh, the kids, I usually start off by explaining a bit about Victorian theatre. We use one of my monologues uh, about Delilah Thompson, who lived at the Halfway House, uh, to talk about how um, Victorian performances were created. And then we end off by talking about the gestures, and I have them do uh, each one of the gestures. So 
I know I mentioned uh, pleading, which is where you clasp your hands together and you go down on one knee, and fear, where you shove your nose and your elbow and look like you're going to run away. Um, but there's also pride, where you put your hands behind your back and you stick your chest out really tall, and it's it's lots of fun, and the kids usually really enjoy it. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's how uh, we use a lot of Victorian theater practices in um, performances today. So now I thought uh, a fun way to end off my uh, talk would be to talk about the mysterious disappearance of Ambrose J. Small. So I mentioned him earlier and a lot of you popped up and said that you had heard of him. Uh, so I thought I would talk about that because that is um, usually what gets talked about instead of the grand, the Oh my goodness, now I'm forgetting the name of the theater that I talked about five minutes ago, Grand Opera House, there we go. So, um, Ambrose J. Small, as I mentioned, he was the manager of the Grand Opera House. And on December 2nd, 1919, Ambrose was in the process of closing a sale of his theatrical assets to a syndicate, Trans Canada Theatres Limited. He sold all of his theater holdings for a profit of 1.7 million dollars. Now that's not 1.7 million dollars in 2020 money. That's 1.7 million dollars in 1919 money. So that is a lot. Holy moly indeed. Um, so he did the deal. He sold his, isn't it amazing? Yeah, I was astounded. He did the deal, he sold his assets, and then he had a meeting with his lawyer, F.W.M. Flock, um, at 5.30 on December the 2nd, and Flock left him at his office in the theater and went home. No one has seen Ambrose Small since. So that disappearance was, it wasn't initially alarming because, oh, let's see if I have slide there we go yeah so there's some of the articles that were um, about his disappearance now his disappearance wasn't initially alarming because uh, Ambrose was known for traveling without informing anyone which I think is bad practice for a married man but anyways he had a lot of bad practice for being a married man um, and he was also a gambler so he would often go off and uh, gamble for quite a long time and so his missing status his missing status actually wasn't put out until January the 3rd. So that's over a month after he disappeared. And that's part of the reason why Ambrose is still considered an unsolved mystery, because um, all of the key evidence that could have been used to figure out who did it was gone by then. It had been trampled over in his office and everything like that. Um, now, one very interesting thing about the case that people focus on is that no one saw him leave the theater. And people were like, well, and he still has to be in the theater. But if you'll remember, I mentioned that separate exit that he had that went out to Johnson Lane, which meant that he didn't have to be seen by anyone if he did leave the building. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Uh, so many theories have been talked about with what happened to Ambrose. Um, there were theories that he had run off with a mistress. Maybe he had uh, been done in by someone that he owed a gambling debt to. He was not an excellent guy, so the theories were boundless. Now, a lot of what happened to his money. Oh, don't worry. I'm going to get to that. So um, he, a lot of fingers were pointed at his secretary, Jack Doughty, if you'll remember I mentioned him earlier. Um, he also went missing just a few days after Mr. Small. Now, people thought that he might have killed him and then went into hiding. People might have thought that he was killed as well, but uh, he was actually found in Iowa a few weeks later, um, and he had gone missing after he cashed in a $100,000 for Mr. Small, so that was also very intriguing. Um, but all he was charged for was the robbery. He apparently had no idea that Mr. Small was even missing, um, and so he wasn't suspected in uh, the disappearance or in the murder. So as I mentioned, there were a lot of possibilities. Uh, you can see in the picture on the left, there are three women there. Those three women are uh, Small's two sisters, and the woman on the far right is his wife. Um, all fingers were pointed at them. Um, there was 
a lot of um, people wondering if it was a spurned lover who had gotten back at him. I mean, if you'll remember, he supposedly had a love nest. But in the end, well, maybe I'll give you a moment just to think about who you think did it. Now, this is a possible ending because a lot of people say that this isn't true. So I'll just, I'll just be quiet for a moment and let you take your own guesses. Increasing the suspense. Book least recently came out about the Ambrose Small case. It did, yeah. Um, and I would really like to get a hold of it because after reading about this, I'm very interested. Anyways, so apparently the person who ended up killing Ambrose J. Small was shockingly his wife. So all of Ambrose's money went to her. He willed it to her. Um, she ended up making a large donation to the Catholic Church. No, not Teresa. I know. I know. It's shocking. But at the end of her life, uh, she confessed. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. I have to mention that he cheated on her relentlessly. He had all of this money. He wasn't a great guy. I'm not saying can you blame her, but you get my drift. Um, apparently at the end of Teresa's life, she confessed to having murdered him in the theater. She dumped half of his body into the Rosedale Ravine dump, and the other half was burned in the Opera House furnace. <laughs> so that's apparently what happened to Mr. Small, but again, that's just, um, that's just a theory. Did she do it by herself? I don't know. She might have had help? Maybe? Maybe she had her own lovers. This is all just a theorizing. Please don't anyone quote me on this. <laughs> so unfortunately, Ambrose is, um, and he, and then cut him in half. Well, I mean, love sometimes makes you half and half. Yep. Love makes you do crazy things. So unfortunately, Ambrose's disappearance uh, ended up overshadowing a lot of the theater, a lot of the history of the Grand Opera House, um, which truly acted as a springboard for Toronto's theater scene because, well, People love to theorize. And shamelessly, I am also one of those people. Um, so who do you think did it? Do you think that it was Teresa? He owned the Grand Theatre in London, Ontario. That's right. Yeah, yeah. He was apparently seen there after his appearance. There is also a man in the United States. Um, you can buy it on Amazon, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Sharifa. I can send you the link after we're done. Um, no problem. And I think, I think that's all that I have to say. So uh, I hope that you enjoyed this very brief uh, synopsis of Victorian theatre, the Victorian theatre in Toronto. Uh, and if any of you have any questions, feel free to ask them and I'll try to answer them as best as I can.